Let me try and show you how we get some of these sounds. First of all, none of them exist as a particular sound, as they would on an electronic organ. There's no magic button marked trumpet or violin or drums. You have to build every sound. And to start to build these sounds, you have to start with something pretty simple. And here are the simple things we start with. There are five of them. The simplest one of all is something that any lab technician must have seen at one time or another. It's called a sine wave. It's very smooth, very flute-like. A little bit more complicated wave is called sawtooth. And it's called sawtooth because on an oscilloscope, oscilloscope screen, it looks just like a sawtooth. And uh, this one is a little richer, a little reedier, and it resembles a lot of sounds found on home electronic organs. Something in between those last two, and a very useful sound indeed, is something called triangular, and it's kind of a pointed sine wave. So you can see it's a little brighter than a sine wave. Um, this one's called pulse wave, and I'm just going to show you how it swings into a thing called square wave. It's uh, up, down, up, down, just like a switch. If you flip a switch, you're making a pulse wave. If it's an even off, on, off, on, then it looks, on an oscilloscope, very symmetrical, and it's called a square wave. And if I take the time that it's on and make it different from the time that it's off, it changes quality. Listen to it. shifts and Terry. It's a very useful sound. The last of which uh, is probably the least useful, although you'd never want to be without it. It's very colorful, very coloristic. In its pure form, it sounds like surf or a steam sound. It's called white noise. Now I'll patch this up here into one of my output modules and um, try and show you how with these primitive sounds we start to get some very musical sounding things. First of all, here's a sawtooth wave that's coming out of an oscillator, going into a mixer coming up into a, what's called a filter, which is going to remove parts of the sound, either the top or the bottom part, much like bass and treble controls do on your you know, high fidelity system. And uh, by hitting a note on the keyboard now, I'm connected up so I'll hear that one sound. It's a very low sound. It's very bright. If I manually turn this knob, you'll listen to the sound get considerably duller. Here it gets very dull down here. It's very bright here. Instead of doing this manually, I can do it automatically with what's called an envelope generator. It generates the envelope, the envelope being this type of motion that I'm shaping the tone with. So I'll do it this way. And that can be speeded up till we almost start hearing a plucked string. If we turn that around and make it uh, open up instead of closing, it does this, which was quite a surprise when I first heard it. It has almost a trumpet-like quality, or trombone quality in this range. And uh, I think the best way to show this is a little excerpt from the first album. You'll hear a trumpet imitation, solo, and then you'll hear several of these put together to show the feeling of an ensemble. And they were all built with the refinement of this thing that I've just shown you now. Now the ensemble. Let's uh, show you how one of these sounds might be laid in to a piece. I have threaded up on the A-Track machine, which is where other voices have been collected already, several of the parts of a piece of music, which is on the new album. This is the Bach Fourth Brandenburg. And the second movement was pretty much played at tempo, one element at a time. Uh, the sound that I'm going to use will be for the solo part, which was originally given to a solo violin. It will be dubbed in only in those sections on the score where it's not doubling the rest of the string orchestra so that in the 2D sections we'll let the full orchestra carry it and uh, that'll make a change of color when the solo part comes in. It's a little bit of editorializing on Bach. I don't think he'd mind. Uh, in this case, let's uh, build a sound that's rather dull on the beginning. I can make this uh, have a little bit harder attack. I could add sort of an octave higher. And then I 
add some vibrato. Tone it down. The vibrato comes in a little after the note sounds. Delay this note a little bit longer. And by patching in another envelope controller, which will now take the oscillator that's supplying the tremolo and speed it up th during the duration of the sound, the vibrato will start slow and get quicker. Don't want to overdo it though. We'll get one of those ghastly electronic organ type sounds. All right, tuning now. I have a 440 oscillator. Take off the vibrato, it's easier. Okay, we're in tune. Everything sounds like it's about right. I'll start the 8-track, and you'll hear all the other components of this score, and I'll add in the solo. <laughs> The development of modern electronics made it possible to recreate music from its component parts, its tones. Well, you're looking at uh, one of the very first 8-track machines. We used it for switched on Bach, well-tempered synthesizer, right through a uh, good half of Clockwork Orange. Wendy Carlos in her studio in Greenwich Village is one of the pioneers of synthesized sound. Her controversial versions of the classics, created entirely electronically, put machine-made music on the map. Now we're listening to the A track and we're mixing, sort of playing the role of the conductor, putting together, in this case, a pair of tracks which has all of the string section. That sounds like this. There's a harpsichord track, and two flutes, and there's this nice solo that's split up into two tracks. Let's put them all together. Needs a little more echo. Yeah, that's good. Her early work was with a Moog synthesizer. Though it's a museum piece now, when it was first introduced, it opened the door to a world of music synthesis. It works by first generating these harsh, bright sounds made up of many pure tones played together. pass these bright waves into a filter, which in this case, literally like your tone controls on a hi-fi set, uh, remove portions or boost portions of the sound. We can make it sound very dull, quite pure, or very bright. And you can do this dynamically in time, so sort of percussive or make it open up, make it sit up there. The Moog was revolutionary. But as it generated many tones together with little control, its sounds were crude. Soon, it was overtaken by a second revolution, controlling individual tones by computer. Unlike the uh, Moog synthesizer, we're not going to be taking away, tearing down bits of a very bright wave. Instead, we're going to put together little overtones, pieces of sounds, uh, characteristic of all sounds, and uh, assemble them additively rather than subtracting parts that we don't want. By adding tones one at a time, Wendy Carlos is able to build precisely the sound she wants. This is the beginnings of a xylophone. Now, obviously, if we want to make it that sound like a xylophone, we're going to have to make it speak more quickly. So I'll shorten the attack from being about a half a second. There. Now it's getting on almost instantaneously, but it's lasting too long. Let me drop that down a bit. Ah, this is much more like a xylophone. Well, that one sounds pretty good. So I'll take that pattern and play a simple music phrase.
Now she specifies three more pure tones in the proportion she already knows a real xylophone produces. Now I'll put in all four of them. Now this is something that's very close to being a replica of a xylophone, but there's an element that's missing, and that is the hammer noise that you get with a real instrument when the mallet impacts against the wood. For this final touch, she adds an electronic shake to each sound component. <laughs> 